great surface, and this is the uh, basics of Cadillac Generation Assembly. Um, bear with me here, I've got to get my motor, I've got to get up to the speed here. Uh, I don't imagine there are too many people that drove down here today that, that didn't have air conditioning operating in their vehicles. Uh, wasn't always the case. Uh, purpose of this seminar is not to make you experts in air conditioning, but just to present an overview of the air of automotive air conditioning as it applies specifically to Cadillac so that you will be a little bit more able to negotiate, if you will, the, the, the field of, of service agencies and, and uh, shops and suppliers out there. Uh, there's a, a tremendous amount of information on websites and, and uh, uh, forums regarding air conditioning. Most of it is good. However, I've run into some stuff that scares the hell out of me when I, I saw some of the suggestions. And what, if any, nothing else I'd like to do is try and give you enough information so you'll know what the scary stuff is. Uh, I've seen suggestions uh, of people making suggestions that are uh, virtually deadly. Uh, and and it, it's indistinguishable from, from the real good information. But there is, but most of the information out there is good. Uh, automotive air conditioning, I believe the first recorded case of an air conditioned vehicle was in 1930. And that was a Houston oil man on a 1930 Cadillac. And the man had some severe allergies. So he had, I guess it was a local refrigeration and air conditioning. Right, there, there were no air conditioning companies out there. It was refrigeration companies. He had a local refrigeration company put a one and a half horsepower Kelvinator unit, condensing unit, on, on the trunk, the fold down part of his certain Cadillac. And it had a gasoline engine on it. And it provided the, the motive power for the cooling system and he had a system of fans and, and uh, ducts that, that brought air into the uh, into the cab. Uh, if it was done in 1930, I would have to imagine that it was methyl chloride that was a refrigerant used. And if, if, if he'd have had a leak, he would have had more than his asthma to worry about. But uh, uh, that was the first recorded official uh, that I'm aware of. Uh, I guess it was 19, between 1940 and 42, Packard. Uh, as a factory, installed 1,500 uh, air conditioning systems, uh, air conditioning systems, and 1,500 of their, their closed cars. Uh, the development of automotive air conditioning went hand in hand with the development of commercial refrigeration and air conditioning, which uh, in the 40s, 50s, 60s was in its infancy. The technologies utilized in, in automotive air conditioning was a was basically a continuation of the same thing that they were doing in in commercial air conditioning. So if you're looking at some of your early fit your early late 50s and early 60s air conditioners and they seem kind of automotive air conditioners and they seem crude, that's what the state of the art they were they were state of the art. Uh, we had the three majors uh, had their General Motors had Frigidaire was uh, Frigidaire was their uh, appliance and refrigeration uh, engineering division. Uh, Ford had Philco, which was their refrigeration division, and Chrysler had Airtown, which was their division. And these three uh, divisions, or the three the divisions of the three majors, were working. Uh, independently to develop air conditioning for their for the, the respective vehicles. Uh, air conditioning was considered a luxury at the time. Uh, you know how many how many buildings in 1960 had air conditioning? Maybe some of the majors, maybe New York and, and Chicago might have had them. Uh, I remember in Los Angeles, uh, you opened a window 
and in what was what we considered our high rise building, which was 12 stories. Uh, air conditioning was a was not the standard that it is today. It wasn't it wasn't expected. Nobody had air conditioning in their homes, uh, and I say nobody had very few people. Get this and not point it in my face. Uh, so basic, yeah, basic air conditioning components for our for the automotive air conditioning system. Well, yeah, the outside. Yeah, uh, if you could go to the next one, please. Got it. Sorry. <laughs> we'll get that. We got outside air and inside return air going through the fan over the cooling coil. It's all cool down. There's a damper here, you've got the heating, hot water heating coil, or the heater coil, I should say. The air comes off the heater coil at 120, it comes off the cooling coil at about 42, and it's mixed to uh, temperature between, typically between 42 and 120, depending on whether you're, you're looking for cooling or heating. Uh, this is the basic system, no controls, just, just the components. Uh, but what, they took the number 20% as the outside air, and typically on all of the systems that we're talking about, early to, to uh, early 50s, 60s, uh, up to the early 80s, uh, they typically used the, uh, the same 20% outside air when you hit, when, when you were on research, they closed the air off when you were on all of the other positions. Uh, you, you were getting in 20% of the air was coming from the outside. Uh, we, uh, okay, let's go back there. All right, we have four basic systems in the Cadillac air conditioning. You have the cooling system, the heating system, the air delivery system, and the control system. All of these systems are essentially independent and operate by themselves. However, in order for the entire system to function correctly, the systems to function correctly, each one of those four systems has to be functioning correctly. Uh, to diagnose uh, to diagnose a problem without diagnose it without verifying all four components, all four systems, is not, it, it's, it, I'm trying to say a waste of time, but it, it, it's not really an effective way to do it. We're going to start with a refrigeration system first. And this refrigeration system, go to the next slide, please. No, I did, okay. Yeah. The refrigeration system consists of the compressor, condenser, uh, the hot dryer side glass, down to the expansion valve, evaporator, section throttling, or POA valve, and then back to the compressor. Starting with the compressor, typically on the majority of the, of the cars we're talking about from the uh, uh, late 50s to the late 70s, early 80s, we've got uh, the, on Cadillacs, you've got the Started a Frigidaire, then it became Harrison uh, A6 compressor. It's a six cylinder, well, it's actually, it's three cylinders with six pistons, uh, dual action, uh, dual, 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 dual action compressor. So she's calming me down. I get, get, get tied up there. Uh, let's go on to the compressor. Uh, one, next slide, please. Next one, please. Okay. We've got three cylinders, and each cylinder's got two pistons in it. The fully rotates, the swash plate goes back and forth, and the piston goes back and forth. The gant refrigerant comes in through the suction, suction port, gets it in through the suction side, and there's ports inside of the compressor. I've got a compressor that, that Take apart, to take apart, and take a look at it. Um, but through a, period, through a series of reed valves, it's drawn as the piston goes goes away from the valve, the head, head plate, 
the fishing is drawn into the cylinder and then compressed as, as the piston go, goes back the other way. The A6 compressor is 12.6 cubic inches of displacement, which means for every rotation of the, of the, of the pulley, the compressor will pump 12.6 cubic inches of refrigerant. Now, that's a kind of an ambiguous number in that 12.6 cubic inches of refrigerant is going to be more or less in, in mass flow in pounds, depending on the temperatures and the pressures that, that you experience. However, what they did when they developed the, when they were developing the air conditioning system, they assume, made some assumptions that the car was going, they, they had to assume where the car was going to be and where, what conditions it was going to be under. They came up with the magic number of 27,000 BTUs as the typical cooling load of one of these. And if you work the numbers backwards, at 25 miles an hour, this compressor turning one and a half times the engine speed will pump enough refrigerant to produce 27,000 BTUs. Now, I've got more information on the handout, and, and you know it, it probably explains it a little bit better. I'm trying to cover a lot of material here, but uh, at one time, I remember back in the early 70s, they had what they called what was what was called a what did they call it? heavy duty compressor a heavy heavy duty compressor and i used to buy those i didn't realize what those were were they were intended for ambulances and uh, uh commercial vehicles commercial cars and all it did was they just put a smaller pulley on them so that meant that at at idle they would be, be turning over a little faster typically the only time that, that any of these vehicles has got a real cooling problem will be at idle. And that's because the compressor is just not turning fast enough. It, it's, it's just a simple matter of that. If you don't pump, if you're not turning the compressor, you can't pump the refrigerant. If you don't pump the refrigerant, you don't get the cooling regardless of anything else. Okay, moving on from the compressor. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, we have got. Two slides back, please. Okay, from the, from the compressor, we go into the condenser. Now that's the radiator in front of your radiator, and its purpose is to, to take a hot gas, a high pressure hot gas, and run it and, and outside air, ambient air over it, and condense the liquid refrigerant inside so that it can be used by the rest of the system. Drains by gravity, a uh, little trick that I learned a long time ago, when you get air in the system, air is a non-condensable, and what happens to that non-condensable is it sits right up there in the top of the condenser, and you end up with a high head pressure, and typically, the first reaction is to let refrigerant out. Uh, it, not necessarily the case. Again, just knowing that that ha that all the air has got to be removed from the system will help. It, uh, or not just knowing it, but making sure that it is will help immensely. Once you get, if you've got air in the condenser, it basically acts as a restriction and won't let the refrigerant flow through. And uh, do what it's supposed to do. Okay. Looks like they put a bleed. Looks like they would have made a bleed line, a bleed in the top of the condenser to bleed off the air. They don't have one. I know. But oh, it looks like no. But most of. I'm sorry for breaking in. No, no, Dwayne, that, that that's fine. Most of the systems were not most of the systems. These systems were intended for automobile mechanics to work on. They were intended for automobile mechanics to read the service manuals and follow the service manuals explicitly. 
And you'll find that if you do follow the factory service manuals explicitly, there, we'll, and we'll cover some more of that a little bit more, uh, you can't really go too far wrong. They tell you if this happens, then that's the problem. And they're all, I will be diagnosing one of my cars, and the manual will say, it, it, you know, this is the problem, and I'll say, no, that can't be the problem, because, and after four or five attempts at something else, I'll go back and, and the manual will write. But, uh, uh, so they don't have a lot of the devices in the systems that you would find in a commercial uh, refrigeration or air conditioning system because they were trying to make them as simple as possible. Uh, and again, this was, you were supposed to follow the procedures, and the procedures are pretty explicit as far as removing air, etc. Okay, dryer receiver. Uh, you typically have got a dissipant. This is a, you typically got a dissipant in there, which is, a dissipant is a material that absorbs water. Uh, and, or, or holds on to the water it molecularly, molecularly, uh, and they use several types of dissidents over the years. But what will happen will be that the moisture, moisture that's in the refrigerant, that if there is any, will end up staying in the dissident uh, and and just pull it out of out of the series and, and uh, doesn't interfere with the operation. Uh, if there is moisture that goes on through, uh, going to the next, going to the next component, the expansion valve. Uh, if there is moisture, no, no, same, same slide. If there is any moisture, the next component in line is the expansion valve, thermal expansion valve. And the purpose of the expansion valve is to control refrigerant flow. Number one, and it does that through a basically a. Uh, a fixed orifice. There's a hole in there that's a certain size and that it's got a maximum flow rate. That, that uh, It's got a maximum that it will flow. What it also does is controls what they call, the, what is called the superheat. That means the condition of the refrigerant when it leaves the evaporator to make sure that all of the liquid has been evaporated uh, that's a, the really the primary purpose of the, the, the expansion valve is to control that superheat. Uh, yeah, I know there's a, adjustments on expansion valves, and people tend to, when they don't get enough cooling, they tend to help turn them counterclockwise to open it up. And, and what they're doing is they're they're not increasing the flow; they're just fooling around. They're just screwing up the the, the settings of the, of the superheat. If you don't have 10 degrees of superheat, meaning that all of the refrigerant is evaporated plus it's 10 degrees warmer, you're going to bring liquid back to the compressor and you're going to knock the compressor out. These do not pump liquid or oil. Liquid meaning refrigerant or oil. That's I, that something that you, know, you don't want to find out. Um, you've next got the evaporator. And what that, what that is is a series of tubes and fins. The refri liquid refrigerant comes in the bottom, typically the bottom of the evaporator, uh, and the air goes over the outside of the fins and, and, the, uh, and the tubes. And the air adds heat to the refrigerant, and the refrigerant inside boils and turns to a vapor. Uh, and that's where, where the heat transfer occurs. The air is cooled down, uh, typically to, again, thinking, thinking about, you've all heard, uh, I've seen, every time I see an advertisement, when they say ice cold air, it kind of, the hair on the back of my neck bristles, bristles, because it can't be ice cold air. If it's ice cold air, then you're going to, you're going to freeze some moisture in the, in the air and you're going to block the coil. Typically, evaporated coils, the air coming off the evaporator coil would be from, from 38 to, to 42 or 43 degrees. That's, that's perfect. Um, especially in the automatic temperature control systems where you, do not, you don't want it any colder. 
Okay, after the evaporator, the refrigerant goes through suction throttling valve, or in, in most of the cases from 1963 and 19, actually to 1976, they had a, a POA valve. And a POA valve stands for Product Operated Absolute. And what that is, is a valve that is intended, if you go to the next slide, please. Next one. That, that's that big long thing now that they're going for about $500. And what that does is it maintains the suction pressure in the evaporator so that it doesn't get, well, it keeps the pressure at between 28, and its purpose is to keep the pressure between 28 and 32 pounds per square inch, which keeps the, keeps the coil surface just above the freezing point. It drops rapidly, it ices up, and you've got no airflow through there. So the intent and purpose of that POA valve or suction throttling valve is to maintain a constant suction pressure, constant coil pressure, constant coil temperature, and a predictable leaving air temperature off of the coil. One of the other things that it does is when you're under low flow, and you don't have a lot of refrigerant going through there, you've got an oil bypass, you have an oil line, bypass line that comes from the bottom of the coil and uh, into a port in the, in the POA valve. And it's, it's, it, its intent and its purpose is to make sure that you get oil bypassing going back to the compressor. Oil in the evaporator will, will lay out in the bottom will separate from the refrigerant, and what isn't going with the refrigerant will separate in the bottom, and that uh, POA valve's function is, also, is, to, is to assure a continuous supply of, uh, of oil to the compressor. Sir, what would be an indication of a problem with that? Uh, What's that? What would be an indication of a problem with that? Uh, with the POA? Yeah. Typically what they do, well, POA is a real simple device, and I've got one here that I've got opened up on the side. It's a spring device. Um, typically, when they don't operate for a while, they will stick in a position, uh, which means that, and typically they, they stick closed, uh, so you don't, get, you don't get anything going through there. Uh, indication of it would be either a a too high or a too low back suction pressure, as you can be determined by a gauge. It's something that you really can't diagnose unless you've got a gauge on there, refrigerant gauge on there. But if you're not, if you've got a device controlling the suction pressure, the evaporator pressure, and it's not working, then the evaporator pressure won't be under control. That's I don't mean to be flippant about it, but that that's that would be the indication of it. And it, it the symptoms can be multiple depend and again we'll get back to back to diagnosis we'll get to diagnosis in a little bit and how the factory does it and how I recommend doing it. On the earlier systems, again the earlier meaning they starting when they first put air conditioning on them in, in the in the early fifties. Uh, no? Keep going. Well, <laughs> oh, just keep going. Okay, that one. Uh, back for one place. I'm going to have to fire. One more. One more. One more. No, no, the wrong way. In the earlier systems in the 50s, they had no, the, the, the method of, the earliest method of control was on off. Uh, however, that didn't work very well with, with, with automobiles. It, it didn't work any better in automobiles than it did in, in uh, commercial air conditioning. When you turn the system off, it gets hot and gets humid. Uh, and, and you get fast cycling. Uh, what they did, uh, in order to keep that, because that compressor was running at constant speed, so something had to happen. It had to get refrigerant someplace. So in lieu of this suction throttling valve, 
what they had was a what they have is a bypass valve, hot gas bypass. They took the, the gas from the discharge of the compressor and dumped it into the evaporator. So it, it, it unloaded the system. It unloaded the, uh, kept the compressor loaded, but unloaded the system. Um, it's kind of complex. It's simple but complex. Um, I didn't want to get into that much detail on, on that. However, uh, uh, it was one of the interim steps, and they used it for a few years. Okay. Let me go to the next slide, please. The next slide. The next slide. Yes, the next. Okay, here is the PLA valve. Uh, you've got the inlet. All you've got is a spring uh, against a, a, uh, a disc that holds the pressure back. Uh, here's where your where your evaporator pressure and where your pressure gauge goes. So you're actually reading the pressure in the evaporator. Here's where the where the oil bypass line goes, which brings the oil back to the compressor. And around the back, I can't see it. You've also got a, a connection for the uh, you got a connection for the expansion valve to read the the external equalized expansion valve. Okay. The next slide, please. Okay, typical layout of all of the components. And this one is, looks like early 60s. Uh, compressor, condenser, back to the, to the uh, uh, dehydrator, liquid line to the expansion valve, into the evaporator, to the DOA, so section throttling valve and then back to the compressor. And you see the, see the layout here now. The air comes from the cab through the evaporator, cool down, and then it's either directed around the, uh, the next coil, around the, cool, the heating coil, and delivered to the cab, or it goes through the cool, mixed through the cooling coil, the heating coil, and re reheated to provide the temperature air that will is necessary to meet the demand of the uh, of the uh, of the system. Your air side, that was the compressor side, the, the air side, you've got again the evaporator, you've got the fan, the evaporator, the heating cup, you've got system of ducts and dampers and deliver the air either to the floor in, in heating mode or to the dash in cooler mode or to the defrost ducts or defrost mode. The air side works completely independent of the refrigeration side, works completely independent of the control side. It is controlled by the control side, but it's got to be working completely. Example being, if you have a blockage, either a damper that's not working in the air side, it doesn't matter what the rest of the system is doing, the system won't function correctly. operating correctly. If your refrigeration system is operating correctly, 
uh, and, and doing what it's intended to do, then the rest of the systems have got the opportunity to fall into place. Now, that tells me, going along this graph, let's take 95 degrees here. It's 95 outside, and it's 30% relative humidity. We go back over here, means we're going to get, we've got the opportunity to get 43 degree leaving air leaving the evaporator. If, however, same 95 degrees and 70% relative humidity, we're only going to get 57 degrees outside leaving the evaporator. That's because the, the, the air requires more capacity to cool it. Uh, it takes more, capa more capacity to take the moisture out of the air than to change the temperature. So these are the expectations, and these are in, in all the service manuals, as well as the refrigeration side, the head pressure. Again, when it's 100 degrees outside and 70%, 325 pounds is probably what you're going to get. Um, sounds like a, a high head pressure, but that's what the system is intended to, to, to live with, and that's what it will do. Next slide, please. Okay, here's something that, that you can live and die with, die by. Uh, according to your service manual for your particular year. You've got the conditions, you've got the... Uh, is that in focus for you guys? A little small.
That does not say they could not operate under something else, when you are using something else. However, there is a sacrifice in performance when you change. There or a sacrifice in longevity or a sacrifice someplace. Uh, there are some, some what they call drop-in refrigerants, and I, I think without really taking a position on it, one of them is called Freeze 12, uh, which is pretty much all propane. Um, as a refrigerant, I'm sure it's wonderful. As a chemical, I don't know what it does to the rest of your system. I don't know what it does to components that have been started, broken in, and operated on refrigerant 12 and mineral oil. The chemical, they take the, the, the materials take a chemical set, if you want to call it that, and you dump something else in there and it, it can change. Uh, Right now, ever while typically there was a big cry to uh, go to change to refrigerant 134A, which you know has got its own it's got its own issues. However, um, for those of you who don't know yet, the U European Union has outlawed refrigerant 134A. Any new vehicle manufactured after, I believe it was January of this year, cannot have refrigerant 134A in it. Uh, they are now using a new refrigerant. It's a Holy Olefin, it's HFO 12341F. Uh, and I think I've got it on, on no I didn't have it on yet. Um, however, for those of you who are buying a new camera, you will experience it because the new X, the XTS and another one have got, have got uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, YF in it so that they will be able to sell those in Europe. And that it, it will be the new refrigerant utilized in this country as well. They will be doing change over to that. Um, we're all worried about refrigerant 12 costing us a lot of money. It's going for somewhere around $50 a pound now. Uh, HFO 1234YF, the best that the manufacturers can tell me is it's going to go for about $70 a pound wholesale. And all you have to buy is a 30 pound jug. Uh, and in order to use it, because they have completely changed the fittings on, on this refrigerant, you have to buy about $7,000 worth of, uh, of equipment. Now, this may, does my heart good because I'd love to see everybody go back to 12 on our cars that were designed for it. However, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, that's the state of the art of refrigerant. It's, it, they've got their both feet firmly planted in midair. Uh, Refrigerant 12, for those of you in this country, in, in Europe, and in, in most of the United Kingdom, uh, in former United Kingdom uh, countries, you can't get 12. Uh, you're not even going to be able to get 134 soon. But uh, uh, 12 is still available. It's expensive, but it works well. Uh, our cars take about a 28%, excuse me, 22% hit. When we take and just, I won't call it qualify by saying converter, when we take and replace the 12 with 134A, we're going to take a 22% hit in performance. And where we experience that is in high temperature, high humidity, high heavy traffic areas. The flat can't do it, the system can't do it. They lose the performance at that point in the envelope, which is probably the most important. They'll operate well on the highway. They'll operate well when, when you're going along and, and the compressor is really cranking. Uh, there, have been, there have been several attempts to make 130, uh, yeah, 134A work by doing this or doing that, and they're all basically trying to hit a target that hit a moving target. Uh, again, I never like 134A, uh, and now I guess I get my my rewards because it's going to disappear. It, by the way, has become very expensive. It's more than tripled in price. 134A has tripled in price. And the reason being is because uh, one of the components 
which is, a, I think it's boron, it's a simple mineral that used to get mined here. Uh, we shut our mines down because they, were, they weren't making enough money, and China is the place that the mines are, and China seems to have problems. Uh, coincidentally, uh, and again, I don't know if anybody else gets the same message, but Honeywell, the, uh, the manufacturer, American manufacturer, set up a plant in China to manufacture HFO 1234YF. The Chinese government is giving them a hard time and demanding more certification and, and got a stranglehold on it. So that's where that's going. Sorry about that. All right. <laughs> Go to the next slide, please. Okay, we're talking about a little bit about controls. And again, the control systems on these vehicles were developed right parallel with the control systems in commercial and uh, air conditioning and refrigeration. They started with from a basic on-off system where you've got a switch that turns the compressor on. When you, when, when you want to turn it off, you turn the switch off. That was the, those were the original ones. It wasn't real, what, what it real capable of controlling temperature, but that's what you have. Uh, the temperature dial from left to right, what you were doing was bypassing more or less refrigerant. System was operating at the same, capa at the same capacity, but more or less of it was, was going through the, through the system to, to provide coolant. 1964, they came out with automatic temperature control, which was an absolute, it was a, a 5G phone. You know, it, it was the, the greatest thing in the world. Um, and what they did was, again, they took the technology that was available then and developed it into a, a, an automotive, a mobile system. Uh, go to the next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, what, that, what, what the auto, early auto, what the automatic temperature control was, they have a sense, what they call a sensor strength, well, we take the temperature of the outside, we take the temperature in the car, and in the earlier ones, we took the temperature of the duct, the discharge of the duct. And we've also got the temperature, you see the temperature dial, this temperature selector dial from 65 to 85 degrees. And the three, in this case four, resistors inserted on the um, page, sensor and part of the reason for the discharge duct sensor they did not want to allow the systems to get too cold they were afraid that if they if, they, if the air in the, in the system was in the cab was too cold people would have detrimental physiological effects so the induct sensor was intended to if the air got too cold it would cause the system to warm it up uh, I found a lot of these early systems with that, that component removed. However, we've got in the, in the layer, you've got the two sensors, you've got the temperature dial, and you've got the amplifier. Next slide, uh, please. Okay, these are the, the sensors, the thermistors, is this what they're called. What they're called? You've got the in-car sensor and the ambient sensor. And you see as the temperature goes, as the temperature goes down, the resistance goes up. As the temperature goes down, the resistance goes up. Next one, please. And this was the earlier one. Uh, you see the duct sensor, well you can see. The duct sensor has got is almost as much authority, as much control as the ambient sensor. 
So it, it gave it a lot of credibility. Now what, what all of this does is the sensor string provides a volt. Next slide, please. Oh, I said, go on. Back, back, back. Back, back, back. Back, back. Okay. Sensor string provides, you have 12 volts to the, to the one side of the sensor string, and you have from 0 to 10 volts at the, at the discharge, at the leaving side of the sensor string. At 0 volts, there's 0 volts going to what they call the, the transducer. And what that does is it lets leave the transducer wide open, uh, which means that uh, full vacuum goes through it. The transducer changes a voltage signal to a vacuum signal. The voltage signal is from the sensor string, and the vacuum signal goes to all of the vacuum components. Uh, two more ahead, please. One more. Okay. Uh, you've, not, you've gone past, here's our transducer, and this is really the heart and soul of the, the automatic temperature control. All, everything before this, the sensor string, the amplifier, all the electrics and electronics, it wasn't really electronics, but the electrics, all, well, their intent is to control this transducer. And when the transducer is, is wide open, it pulls full vacuum through the system and pulls the power servo and the power servos are various configurations to the full heat position. When it's less, when the voltage is lesser, uh, it goes to the, when you've got 10 volts to the transducer, it closes it and you're in full cooling position. Uh, Also, in the conjunction with this power servo, there is a little vacuum valve on there, and as this power servo moves back and forth, the vacuum valve rotates and opens and closes various ports. It's very convoluted, I guess that's the best word to describe it. It's very exotic, exacting, and it's very particular. Unless everything is working correctly, unless all of the vacuum lines are are intact, all the connections are, are good, uh, it's, you're not going to get the system to work. Uh, and that, and that I, guess, I, I guess I say it best when I say I think whoever invented the system had to have stock in the vacuum hose manufacturing business because there's got to be 10 miles of vacuum hoses on these cars. Um, I can't quantify it, but Probably 90% of the problems that I have found on these early systems are either poor connections on the vacuum lines, broken vacuum lines, disconnected vacuum lines, or poor connections on the electrical components. Most of these components will, most of these components are, will last for just about ever. Uh, the problem comes from the, the years uh, and lack of use, I guess, is the best way. It, well, the vacuum lines harden, crack, come apart. Somebody has changed them in an attempt to fix something. Um, the first thing I do with any of my systems is go line by line on these vacuum lines and trace out, trace out the lines. It's really tedious and time consuming, but it's the only way to do it. Press out the lines, make sure that they're connected to where they're supposed to be, make sure the connections are good, and then do the same thing with all the electrical components. Uh, can next slide, please? There you go. Thank you. This is, uh, a, this is a, later, uh, a, a later model, 71 to 6, I guess, and this shows you the vacuum valve of the this is the programmer that you'll find on under the dead, under the glove box on the passenger side, a plastic box that's up on against the firewall. 
all of the control components are inside that, that programmer. You've got the power servo, you've got the transducer, you've got the amplifier, uh, and the output from that is on, you've got a plug-in uh, vacuum connection, which goes to all of the all of the mode valves, the heater valves, all of the valves that, that have to function correctly um, for, this, for the system to work. Okay. Later on in the, in the, in the I guess as they started getting into emissions controls, they started having less and less available vacuum. Uh, commensurate with the same time, the development of, of solid state components uh, got to a place where they started using uh, uh, linear actuators instead of vacuum lines. They started using uh, solid state controllers instead of instead of these manual vacuum controllers, and it gets us into a, a whole different different type of system. Uh, on page. On page 25, we've got the same the control diagnosis matrix, which is basically the, the, the Bible on, on your control system. And again, this one was for I'm not sure what year I took out of, but they're all they, they're all very much typical as far as the layout. Uh, and again, you've got your Indication of, of what's supposed to happen at what position. You put your you put your uh, control lever settings at the at the various positions, and this is what is supposed to happen. If in fact something else is happening, you've got an issue with with that with that component. Uh, you know, start looking start looking there for your problem rather than than, than someplace else. Um, Again, I have seen so many of the systems. I've got a, a type of repair I call a disre, and I take things apart and put them back together, and they seem to work. And that's primarily because when you take take electrical connections apart, you can take a look at them, put them back together, you typically clean them up, and you've got a good connection. Same thing with vacuum lines, um, and. Uh, I did some questions. <laughs> yeah. Is part of the restoration and repair of one of these systems? I'm sorry? I said it's part of the repair or restoration. Yeah. Would you recommend just replacing all the vacuum hoses? Um, typically you don't have to. Um, if it's got if the system, if the car is deteriorated to, to that point. And again, if you've got one that somebody's torn apart, the vacuum, the vacuum hoses themselves are, unless, unless they've been damaged, you can trim the ends off and reconnect them. Um, some of the hoses, I, I don't know, I'm trying to think, I don't know that I've ever replaced an entire vacuum, vacuum system, vacuum hose system. I've replaced a lot of hoses and I've put Connections in or places where, say, a hose got got damaged in the middle, broken in the middle, like I spliced in a, in a piece of hose. But uh, the believe it or not, the, the rubber in these was was good enough that most of them, unless they've been burned or exposed to some sort of a uh, a real a real uh, uh, hazardous condition, they they're they can be fixed. Uh, but it's real important that some, if the system is not operating correctly, if things aren't going the way they're supposed to, in accordance with these matrices, matrices, then you need to start, first thing you need to do is look at the vacuum line connections and make sure that everything is going to where it's supposed to be. And then typically on the, uh, on the back, on the, uh, go back to the, back one, two, there, that, that's good. Typically on, on the actuators, uh, what 
I typically do is disconnect each actuator and I've got a little head vacuum pump and make sure that that actuator itself works because they've got diaphragms in them, a little diaphragm goes across there and those are, those are actually exposed to this, if you recall, this is vacuum line and the vacuum line is connected to the engine and the engine is connected at the intake manifold and there's gas fumes in the intake manifold. Uh, the gas fumes are really detrimental to the diaphragms in, in, in uh, these actuators. So they will, they will fail well in advance of, of the, the vacuum lines themselves. But I make sure that each one of those vacuum, um, vacuum actuators is functioning. Uh, and again, each, each component. Going back to the, uh, going back to the sensor strength. I also measure, the, uh, disconnect and measure the value of each of the sensors at the temperature it, uh, that it's measured at, uh, that, that it is. In an example, if I'm in the car and it's 90, 80 degrees in the car, I should get a certain, certain uh, reading according to that chart. Should get a certain reading of resistance on that, on that uh, sensor. Um, if I don't, then I look for problems in that sensor. Uh, however, uh, typically what happens, well, typically, no typically with these things, but um, what we get a lot is systems that go to full heat or full cooling. And full heat, the first thing I look for when a system is at full heat, assuming that first glance everything seems to be working or seems to be in place, is I look for an open connection in the sensor strain because when there is no resistance in the, uh, or maximum resistance I should say, when there's an open sensor strain, the system will go to full heat. And by the same token, when the system goes to full cooling, everything else being functional, I look for a short someplace in there. Uh, and again, over the years, the R systems have been modified, if you want to call it, by people trying to make them work. Uh, those ice cold air systems, uh, what I've found is uh, sometimes they shut off the heater valve so that it no longer reheats the air. Sometimes they, they modify the, uh, uh, the temperature dial. You, that is adjustable. Your temperature selection dial has got an adjustment in it. You crank, crank it so when it's indicating 65 or 85, it wants 65 before it's set, before it gives you the right value. Uh, and, and people have done these uh, things over the years in attempts to, uh, to make these systems work. They're simple systems, they're honest systems, they're not complicated, but they're complex. And if you take it one step at a time and one component at a time, I know we've covered a lot of stuff and I've got a little bit, a little frazzled here, but, uh, your factory service manual is the thing to, to go by. Uh, they, repeat myself, they were intended for automobile mechanics to become air conditioning technicians and be able to operate, be able to repair, if you will, or adjust the, uh, the air conditioning in the Cadillac uh, motor cars. Yeah. Greg, uh, one uh, comment, I uh, had excess R12 and I brought some 12 ounce cans if anyone's interested. But on uh, my 59, on the vacuum valve, mm -hmm. I've had trouble with those failing and my only solution has been to substitute one that did work. I can't figure out, but I try to, uh, it, it seems to be real sensitive to surface contact. But how do you is there a way to repair the vacuum valve? Right there, yeah, the little round one. The lever, lever makes the selection for the vacuum direct vacuum motor. Oh, the, the vacuum, vacuum on, the, on the control head? Right there in the middle of your diagram, the vacuum valve. Okay, right now that would, would be on the, uh, uh, the, 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 the power, this one will be on the power. There, there's one in the heater and one, one in the air conditioning. Okay. And here, there are people that, and they call them rebuild them. I've never 
successfully taken one apart and put it together. But they, they take a little bit of a, uh, they've got to be machined correctly. Uh, they get dirt in them and they get scratched and, and they, they leak. And I don't think most of them have got anything that, that's actually sealing them. They just uh, metal to metal contact. Right. Right. So if, if they're clean, and you say you don't have the original, or you? No, I've got a bunch of them, and I just go through them and find one that works. I've got a whole stack that don't work anymore. Well, just take it, take the, the clip comes out of them, and you take them apart, right? Yeah. And uh, just make sure that they're, they're clean. Make sure that the, the surfaces are as smooth as they can be, I guess. And, uh, and, and they fit together snugly. They're not rocket science, you know, they're, they're, just, they're just direction valves. Right, but I've never had one that isn't working that I've been able to clean up and make work. And I'm just wondering how, if there's a technique to do that. Uh, I've been fortunate enough that I've been aimed at, I've needed, I've been able to buy. Uh, however, I guess it, it, just like uh, I, I uh, Carl, we drove our 76 out here, and the uh, compressor clutch was was slipping, and, and uh, what I did was adjusted it uh, tighter. And I figured, well, you know, I'm going to be going 3,000 miles. I'll probably get a new clutch. I went to buy one. You can't get those anymore. So I guess your valves are going to be something. I had to, I had to get something else. But. We're going to have to start, some of them are going to have to start doing that. There are vendors that sell those things or rebuild them. I think there's, there's somebody in Florida here and there's a uh, whole there in Texas and, uh, and they, they actually go through and remanufacture them. And I, I would imagine that means machining them to, a, to the correct tolerance. And that, that's what it did. Uh, if, if they leak, they're not going to function. I mean, if they, if they leak the, between the two surface, surfaces, they're, they're not going to function. They're just going to, you're not going to get any, any control out of them. Yeah. Are the actuators rebuildable? Hmm? Are the vacuum actuators rebuildable? Um, they say probably are. However, they're still available. Yeah. I, I found out those still being available. Uh, they don't look exactly like the original ones. But they function just as well? I agree, Bill. What you have to do, you have to take a die grinder, make a bunch of little slots and a yeah. crimp so you can open them up. And then you can either, if you have one, slot them and have a wire on the back of them a certain length. And that's connected to the diaphragm. Mm -hmm. So you either get a good diaphragm from a valve you don't need, or you can buy a current one from a parts store that's plastic. Mm -hmm. Open it up and take the diaphragm out of it and put it in your metal room. Recrimp it, solder it up, and it will look just like this. Uh, again, that's going to be have to something that people are going to have to do more and more as as they as these things disappear off the out, out, off the factory shelves or off the warehouse shelves. But as of right now, I've been able to get the few that I've needed. Do your test with the hand back in the day on the mm -hmm. pump. What do you look for? Uh, time to think to look, look, for. look for for motion in the in the output of those actuators. There'll be there'll be a rod on the end of on the end of it and it'll move in and out. Uh, it's pretty simple. They either work or they don't. And, and typically what what'll happen is You'll find that it either doesn't move at all or just moves a little bit and then goes back and it leaks. So I have a problem with that under hard acceleration or going up a hill or something, the engine goes drawn up back and away from the control and then it shuts the vents off. It's a sign that something's leaking. Right, what, what year? 62. Probably accelerated too hard. No. <laughs> um, well, I, I, when I was younger, I couldn't figure out why when I was going across the desert, my air conditioning on my 72 L level wouldn't work anymore. And somebody told me because you run out of vacuum. Because you know, at 120 miles an hour, you don't have much vacuum. However, in yours, you should have a vacuum canister, and there should be a check valve. 
in that in the in the circuit. Uh, and can you go back? Um, let's see if we can find. I'm not sure. Yeah, there we go. You've got a. Make sure. Point this at me. You've got a vacuum storage can, and you've got a vacuum check valve in here. Yeah, I mean, that's actually yeah. You've got a vacuum check valve in here, which means this is connected to the uh, to the engine. Which means when a vacuum here drops, this valve shuts, and you're pulling your vacuum off of your off your re reserve reservoir. And uh, if you've got a leak in that, or if it's not connected, or the check valve isn't working, you will have that problem. But typically, for the majority of the operation, these systems will function correctly. You know, even under under moderate acceleration, continued. Full throttle, they, they they won't work. But uh, for you know, accelerating onto the freeway or you know passing or something, it, it should be seamless if everything's working correctly. It's supposed to be anyhow. Yeah. <sighs> yeah. Back to the refrigerants a little bit. I, I have a '71 that I'm in the process of switching over to the R134A. Now I hear that that's not going to maybe be the the best thing to do. I haven't put any refrigerant in, in it yet. Should I go back to the R12 or or what? Where where would I be with the non uh, would, hand fans? If you them? haven't done anything, I would I would stick with R12. I would stick with R12. We, there is another refrigerant that I I'm, I'm real excited about, but it's difficult for most people to get a hold of. It's it's, it's a commercially available. Major manufactured refrigerant. It's, it's R414B. It goes by the name of, of Icor Hotshot. And it was designed specifically as a supplemental refrigerant for use in commercial refrigeration, meaning pie cases, beer boxes, reach ins. Uh, commercial refrigeration is used R12. Um, they couldn't possibly convert all of that stuff to, to anything because it wouldn't work under those applications. So they developed a refrigerant that was a drop-in for those applications. That works excellent for, uh, for our automotive air conditioning. I've got it, our 76. Uh, that was, didn't miss a beat all the way from Southern Texas uh, as far as performance. Uh, but it's only available in, through a regular refrigeration and air conditioning wholesale house. You need a license to buy it, and you, without being flippant, you need to know what you're doing to it to use it. If you can get R12, then, then, then I would recommend that you stick with it. The cost, look, it, how much it costs us to fill our gas tanks these days? You know, the cost of $50 a pound if your refrigerant, if your system is. Check, leak checked and leak proof and, uh, and, and sealed, you're not going to need that much refrigerant. You run, if you run your system once a month, once every couple, three weeks, you're going to keep the compressor seal lubricated, the compressor seal intact, and you're not going to leak refrigerant. Um, you know, again, that's my recommendation. Uh, I have no, no vested interest in any of this stuff, any parts, materials, or anything else. I don't have a shop. I don't do work. Uh, but it's just my own experience and my own recommendation. <laughs>